Well, good afternoon. We'll call this uh, hearing to order. I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to welcome our, our guest with us today, Secretary of Treasury, Mr. Mnuchin. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today we'll look forward to discussing the Department's budget request, as well as some of the assumptions and policies included in the President's overall request for this uh, upcoming uh, year of 2018. The President's budget proposes cutting spending by $3.6 trillion over the next 10 years while making key investments to spur economic growth and job creation. And we've all heard what the critics have said, and there might be a few critics in here today, but uh, Mr. Secretary, I am not one of them. I believe the President's budget is honest and it's impressive. It includes major middle income and business tax cuts through tax reform, allowing, allowing individuals and constituents all across the country to keep more of their, their paycheck for themselves. It also has a trillion dollar public and private plan for national infrastructure. It rescues families from a failing health care law. It builds upon our spending cuts and further reduces the size of many federal agencies, if not eliminating the agencies altogether. The President rightly wants to have fewer bureaucrats around to regulate our lives and in order, and in doing that, it will free up funding for border security and for strengthening our military. So I look forward to continuing the discussion on the President's vision for balancing the budget here today. The Department of Treasury's mission is vast and it plays a vital role in helping to shape and implement the President's economic policies. This includes working to reform the tax code, monitoring risk and fostering growth in the financial system, increasing access to credit for small businesses, and promoting economic prosperity for all Americans. For this upcoming year, the Department is requesting to spend $11.2 billion, which is nearly $400 million less than last year. That's a cut over last year. Treasury's largest bureau is the Internal Revenue Service, accounting for nearly 94% of all the Treasury's budget requests. And while the budget proposes cutting the IRS's top line by 2%, it is also prioritized uh, by, by requesting to support infrastructure in its IT department and modernization and improving cybersecurity overall. I'm interested in hearing from you today, Mr. Secretary, on how funding for these priorities will improve the taxpayer experience. The request before us also includes $117 million for the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence. And this is a $5 million reduction from last year as well, but this office does does a lot, and it's not just overseas policy, but it also has a critical role of enforcing sanctions against rogue nations and nuclear proliferators, freezing ec accounts of terrorists, money launderers, and drug lords, and producing intelligence for Treasury leadership and national security officials. This office also has the dual purpose of safeguarding our financial system against illicit use and protecting our citizens from national security threats. I'm also interested to know about the challenges facing the Treasury in dealing with so many looming threats and ensuring that the Department has adequate resources to help keep our country safe. The Secretary's budget also includes $27 million for a newly created Cyber Security Enhancement Account. Now, this account was established uh, in our most recent government funding bill to strengthen the Treasury's cybersecurity posture and mitigate threats to the U.S. financial infrastructure. Cybersecurity is one of the most urgent challenges facing the country. And I hope to hear from you today, Mr. Secretary, on how the Treasury is going to use these resources that were recently provided to protect against and respond quickly to the cyber threats that we see. Before closing, I want to say that I'm grateful for the swift action that the administration has taken to jumpstart our economy. Over the last few months, the administration has issued executive orders to right-size and streamline the federal government reduced waste and duplication, and cut red tape. The positive effects are already being felt. Since January 20th, less than five months ago, business enthusiasm has risen at extraordinary rates. Our gross domestic product has increased 1.2%. Nearly 600,000 new jobs have been created, and unemployment is down another half a percent to 4.3%, the lowest in a decade. Now that's exciting. What does all this mean? This means that more people are experiencing the dignity of work and the fulfillment of providing for their families. So Mr. Secretary, I look forward to learning more today about the Treasury's continued role in spurring our economic growth and job creation. 
And Mr. Mnuchin, thank you again for taking the time to meet with us and be with us here today, and we look forward to hearing your testimony in a few minutes. And right now I'd like to uh, recognize uh, uh, our ranking member, Mr. Quigley, for any opening remarks he may have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here today. Uh, the role the Treasury Department plays in both domestic and global economy cannot be overstated. Not only do you and your department oversee the federal government's ability to collect trillions in revenue and finance government operations, but you are also charged with investigating and protecting our financial system from the illicit and criminal activities of both foreign and domestic adversaries. That's why I'm so disappointed with this year's Treasury budget request, which slashes funding by $372 million. For the IRS, this means a cut of $260 million. After factoring in built-in costs, such as statutory pay raises, inflation, and infrastructure maintenance, the cut is, in real terms, closer to $630 million. That is on top of the nearly $1 billion that has been cut from the agency since 2010. In order to meet this new draconian funding level, the IRS would need to reduce staffing by 6,000, adding to, more, to the more than 17,000 that the agency had already lost over the last seven years. This is simply a formula for expanding the tax gap, empowering tax cheats, and confusing honest taxpayers. You yourself, Mr. Secretary, had previously said that the IRS is, quote, under-resourced to perform its duties and that further cuts will, quote, indeed hamper our ability to collect revenue. I was also deeply troubled by the elimination of the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, which plays a vital role in spurring economic growth and revitalization in our most underserved and neglected communities. In my hometown of Chicago, CDFIs are investing tens of million every year to provide low-income families with affordable housing, neighborhoods with safe community centers, and small businesses with the capital to grow and hire local workers. For the cost of less than 80 cents per American, this program helps CDFIs across the country support the creation of tens of thousands of jobs, financing for over 13,000 businesses and more than 33,000 affordable housing units. And that's just for last year. This is not only a hugely successful program, but it's bipartisan which is evidenced through the increased funding it received in this year's omnibus. There are numerous other cuts to the department that are harmful as well, including questionable reductions to cybersecurity enhancement at a time when hacking and identity theft are at all-time high, cuts to programs that safeguard our financial system from criminals and enforce trade and economic sanctions, and unwise reductions to various inspectors general offices, particularly the premature 50 percent cut to the Special Inspector General for TARP, which is still charged with auditing the $38 billion in open TARP programs that will last until 2023. But I want to briefly touch upon something that you bring <clears throat> up in your written testimony, and that's the issue of financial regulation. Last Friday, the President tweeted his support for the House passed bill to repeal Dodd-Frank. It is surprising to see how easily some folks forget that less than a decade ago, a financial crisis sparked the biggest global recession since the Great Depression and pushed our economy to the brink of collapse. Main Street businesses and families suffered even greater, than loss, greater losses than Wall Street as home values declined, retirement savings shrank, and credit dried up. And how did we get there? A disastrous combination of irresponsible lending, overly complex derivatives, highly leveraged and undercapitalized banks, and inadequate regulatory oversight. No serious person would argue that the status quo, which almost crippled our economy, was working before the crisis. We need to make our finan financial markets safer, more transparent, and more accountable. And that's exactly what Dodd-Frank has done. We can all agree that rules need to be tweaked to make sure that small banks are not overly burdened with rules intended for those that pose a systemic risk to our economy and that Dodd-Frank came up short on reforming Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. But gutting Dodd-Frank and rolling back the clock isn't the answer. The answer lies in Democrats and Republicans working together in a bipartisan way to continue to improve the safety and soundness of our financial system. I look forward to discussing these and other issues with you today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Quigley. Now I'd like to recognize Mr. Freelingheisen, uh, Chairman of the Full Committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman, for the time. I also want to uh, welcome uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, 
to the committee, and uh, you fill some historic shoes. Good luck to you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we look forward to your testimony and hearing your frank and candid views on uh, many issues, some of which have already been brought up. Uh, today's hearing is part of a process we follow to determine the best use of taxpayers' dollars. After all, the power of the purse lies in this building, not elsewhere, and it's Congress's obligation uh, to make spending decisions on behalf of the American people. There is quite a lot of focus uh, at home on uh, the issue of uh, the viability of the Internal Revenue S Service. I, I do share some of those concerns. Uh, we obviously want an agency that's responsible and helpful to our constituent. And while I'm hopeful that Congress will be able to reform our burdensome and outdated tax code to make filing taxes a simpler process, I'm still tr troubled by the, the problems that appear to plague uh, that agency. I'm eager to hear, we are eager to hear, how you plan to address some of these concerns. And like the chairman, I, I share uh, concern about the Treasury's Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, which plays such a critical role in keeping our nation safe by safeguarding our financial system against illicit use in combating rogue nations, terrorist facilitators, uh, as well as money launderers, drug campaigns, and other national security threats. These efforts include disrupting ISIS finances and enforcing sanctions against bad actors like Iran and North Korea, and they're constantly trying to penetrate our system and, and do it damage. Given the, the current national security challenges we face, we must ensure that the department continues to invest in these critical programs. Again, I welcome you to the committee, and I thank the chairman for his time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now I'd like to recognize Mrs. Lowy, a uh, ranking member of the full committee. Good to have thank you today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Quigley for holding this hearing. And as a former New Yorker, I'm sorry you had to leave us, Secretary Mnuchin. Welcome, and thank you for being here today. Mr. Secretary, your fiscal year 2018 budget request does not prioritize the taxpayers, economic development, or the ability of your department to combat terrorist financing and other national security threats. Instead, your budget would decrease the IRS funding by $260 million, eliminate all discretionary grant programs in the Community Development Financial Institutions Fund, and this is shocking to me as a former New Yorker, I just don't get it, it would reduce the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence by $6 million. According to the taxpayer advocate during the 2017 tax season, Americans who called the IRS for assistance were on hold for an average of 47 minutes. And even then, only 40% of the calls were even answered. With these cuts, taxpayer services will become even worse. The ability of the IRS to identify wrongdoing is also in jeopardy. Without adequate funding levels for IRS enforcement, we will simply not have enough manpower to catch bad actors, making it very clear if you want to cheat on your taxes, this budget is for you. The FY18 request falls far short in the fight against phishing scams and identity theft, theft schemes, which appear to be never ending, in addition to depleting the IRS of resources to be responsive to taxpayers seeking clarity on the tax code. CDFI awardees originated $3.6 billion in loans and investments financed 13,000 businesses and 33,500 affordable housing units. In our home state of New York, there are 79 certified CDFIs that have financed 950 businesses for a total of 163 million in loans in FY16 alone. 
CDFIs expand economic opportunity for underserved communities by supporting the growth and capacity of a national network of community development lenders. This program's elimination is incomprehensible to me. It's cuts like this, Mr. Secretary, that make it clear this budget request is merely an ideological document for fulling campaign promises and not an attempt to improve the lives of taxpayers. That being said, Mr. Secretary, I do look forward to a productive discussion this afternoon and to working with you to achieve the Treasury Department's goals while serving the best interest of the American taxpayer. Thank you for appearing before us. Mr. Secretary, we uh, welcome you today and, and certainly welcome a five-minute statement from you. And uh, if you have uh, in a statement that is longer than that, I think we already have here, we'd be happy to include that in as part of the record. But appreciate you joining us and, and fielding our questions and comments today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Quigley, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to meet today. I look forward to working with this subcommittee on funding key priorities for the benefits of the American people. One of the President's promises to the American taxpayer was he would make sure their money is spent wisely. A budget should not be an end into itself, but a means of improving the lives of Americans. More money does not necessarily translate into better policy. And so the President has challenged every agency and department to identify greater efficiencies and savings that can be realized both immediately and in the years to come. The administration is proud to submit a budget that achieves this goal. This budget makes some difficult choices because of necessary constraints. We carefully evaluate the allocation of resources to each of the department's important functions and made prudential reductions where needed. But these choices in no way diminish our ability to operate the government effectively. The President has made it clear National security is the top priority. And in accordance, Treasury's request prioritizes national security and cybersecurity programs. Another top goal of Treasury is creating sustained economic growth. With all Treasury does, we have this mission in mind. This much needed growth will be achieved through a combination of tax reform, regulatory reform, and trade. This means working with Congress to pass legislation that allows taxpayers to keep more of their hard-earned paychecks. If we develop the right policies today, we will secure a prosperous future for our children and grandchildren. The difference between recent sluggish growth and a return to a 3% or higher GDP is trillions of dollars in the economy, making a meaningful difference in the lives of all Americans. This budget prioritizes the funding for Treasury's wide array of economic and financial tools, including sanctions. And our enemies have changed, so too have our weapons to combat them. We are honing the economic and financial tools in our arsenal, arsenal to disrupt the financial resources and procurement capabilities of those who wish to do us harm. This includes actions against destabilizing regimes terrorist networks, and drug traffickers. Stopping the flow of funding to dangerous non-state actors, working with foreign partners to keep their financial systems secure, protecting our own financial system, these key programs are critical to the continued safety and stability of the nation. Protecting Treasury and the financial system from cyber attacks is critical to our financial stability. Cyber attacks against our agency or the financial system have the potential to impact markets, the economy, and national security. The Cybersecurity Enhancement Account makes investments in enterprise-wide cybersecurity capabilities that allow Treasury to better defend against cyber attacks and more efficiently respond and recover when they do occur. This account also makes investments in critical <clears throat> infrastructure protection, allowing Treasury to work collaboratively with the financial services sector to increase their operational resilience. As I mentioned earlier, tax and regulatory reform are marquee items for economic growth and job creation. It has been over 30 years 
too long since we have had comprehensive tax reform in this country. We are committed to changing that. Such reform means a simplified code that will provide simpler taxes and relief to middle Americans while making our business competitive again. We have taken a comprehensive approach to regulatory relief, meeting with hundreds of people across the financial industry, including community, regional, and large financial institutions, consumer advocacy groups, academics, think tanks, trade groups, and insurers. We have heard about what works, what does not work, and what can be done to level the playing field. Our reforms will spur economic growth by increasing access to credit, providing relief is secure and stable and does not put taxpayers at risk. We have an opportunity to do great things for the American people, and I look forward to working with members of this subcommittee on these important issues. Thank you very much, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, we'll, we'll have a few questions, and I guess before we get into questions, let me just remind uh, the panel here that uh, we're going to stick to the, uh, the five-minute uh, customary uh, questions and reply time. And so I would just advise you, if, um, if Mr. Secretary is uh, not getting to the answer you're seeking, maybe respectfully uh, redirect and know that around the five-minute time, that will be the end of, of your time. So. Uh, so we can get through everybody's questions. Mr. Secretary, just real quickly, and then I'm going to go to Mr. Quigley. You, you, you stated the priorities, and I, and I appreciate the priorities uh, just being forthright, national defense and the taxpayer. I, that's, those are the two that I really pulled out of what you said. Uh, let me thank you for putting the taxpayers first. Uh, for far too long, it seems like we've, we've heard of putting government first and taxpayers secondary. And so it's, it's to me, it's it's uh, it's encouraging to hear that uh, that the administration, the administration, including yourself, believe that the taxpayers are primary. Could you just sort of remind the committee here and and uh, maybe reflect back on the last four and a half five months as to what has occurred in our economy? How many families have been impacted? The growth of of the GDP. What does all that mean? And then where do you see that going in the next uh, six, eight, ten months? And, uh, and then how does, how does that fit into the vision that you and the administration have? Uh, well, first of all, thank you. It's a, it's a great honor to be here and serve in this role. And I've had the opportunity to work with the President for over the last year on his economic policies and tax reform, so I've been thinking about this for a considerable period of time. Uh, we are very committed to achieving sustainable 3 percent GDP. I've heard lots of people and many economists tell me why that can't be done. We don't believe that. We think it needs to be done. The difference between 2 and 3 percent GDP is over $2 trillion over the 10-year period, and that is critical to our economy. If you look at the stock market, there's been trillions of dollars in increase. That's a sign of confidence in the Trump administration's economic policies. Tax reform, regulatory relief, and trade are key components of that, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. Early on when the budget came out, I know there's been a lot of uh, questions, and uh, there's been critics and cynics, as I stated earlier. Uh, my first response was uh, that it was impressive and it was honest. Uh, one, it was impressive because the administration was keeping its promises to balance the budget. And uh, they did that by being honest. Tough decisions would have to be made in order to fulfill that. And, uh, and I suspect that today some of the questions might come to that honest side, the, the honest choices that have to be made. And, uh, and I know that uh, Mr. Quigley would probably like to touch on that uh, right about now. So, Mr. Quigley, I'd be happy to turn to you for any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the debt ceiling. Uh, apparently, the President has, has appointed you as the point person on raising the debt ceiling. Is, is that correct, sir? That is correct. Uh, and you have said you want to get this done before August. Uh, I have. It is traditional for Treasury secretaries to be the point person on this. Uh, as I've said repeatedly, starting with the letter that I wrote to Congress earlier in the year, uh, I think it's one thing to make decisions about how we spend money. But once we've spent the money, we have to pay for it. The U.S. dollar is the reserve currency in the world, and we're the best credit in the world, and we need to keep it that way. And I urge Congress to act on this as soon as possible. And my preference, as I've stated, is before everybody leaves for August. Well, you said two things. And I want you to tell me why, tell us why, if you would, please, each one is important. 
Uh, first, a clean debt ceiling being preferable and the fact that you'd want it before August. Why do both of those matter? And if you could elaborate. Sure. Well, well let me first emphasize, uh, and, and I've said this recently, if for whatever reason uh, Congress does not act before August, we do have backup plans that we can fund the government. So I want to make it clear that, uh, that that is not the time frame that would create a serious problem. <coughs> However, markets don't want us to wait. Um, the sooner we do this, the better. Uh, there could be events in the world that make it more difficult for us to borrow. And uh, I am very focused on doing this as soon as possible and look forward to working with the House and the Senate on that. Um, and why a clean debt ceiling? My preference would be that uh, we address the debt ceiling as a debt ceiling increase and respond to budget decisions in a budget and through the appropriation process. I think as you see in the President's budget, uh, we have emphasized that it is important to balance the budget, uh, but let me just say that the debt ceiling should not be a Republican issue or a Democrat issue. It should be an acknowledgement that we have spent the money and need to fund the government. Back to your first point, you talked about preferring it to be in August, but theoretically they could go later. Uh, do you have an estimated date uh, the Treasury is projecting that the extraordinary measures will be exhausted? We, we've, or, run or lots range? Of, we've run lots of models, and uh, there are lots of different assumptions. Um, I am comfortable saying that we can fund the government through the beginning of September. I would prefer not to give a range at this time, but obviously if we don't fund the government, we don't raise this beforehand, uh, I will be providing updated numbers based upon how revenues come in. And if you could finally just elaborate a little bit on what happens if we don't raise the debt ceiling. I, I don't need to elaborate on that since I can't imagine that that would ever be a scenario. Uh, but it would obviously create significant market disruption. Uh, our counterparts who rely upon us as the reserve currency and who own our debt would have issues. So I can't imagine that we would get to a point where we don't raise it. Uh, as you know, this has occurred uh, many times with my predecessors. Uh, it has been raised in the past. And uh, my suggestion at some point going forward is that uh, Congress considers changing the timing so that the debt ceiling matches the budget process so we don't have to deal with this in this format. Thank you. I yield back for now. Thank you. Mr. Yoder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, welcome to the committee. We appreciate Thank your you. testimony. I uh, was encouraged by the comments of the chairman as you discussed uh, the uh, vision for 3% growth in the country. Uh, we've had uh, a number of secretaries testify before this committee. We've had a lot of debates about priorities, uh, and I think we all want to see uh, deficits reduced. We want to see job opportunities grow. We want to see the economy expand. Uh, we want a, the ability to invest in things in Washington when uh, there are needs, such as our national defense or medical research priorities that we all share. But it's really hard to do that when we're running significant deficits. We have growth at 1.7 percent. And so I thought, uh, one, I'd just like to compliment, um, I think, that approach of focusing on growth is really a rising tide that lifts all boats. And we have sort of a, a split dilemma in this committee and in this country of are we trying to grow the size of government or are we trying to grow the size of the economy and the private sector? And it's hard to do both at the same time. And obviously that's why the administration's been so strong on reducing the size of the government uh, to take that strain off American taxpayers while growing the economy. You get to a point where you actually can balance the budget, which is what the American people uh, demand, I think, of both parties and of Washington, D.C. to do its job. And so uh, I certainly appreciate the administration leading that way, even if we don't all agree with the spending reductions that have been laid out. The intent, I think, is clear and that's where the American people want us to go. Would you take a minute maybe and just describe uh, how 3% growth uh, would impact uh, our constituents, uh, some of the uh, leading indicators that we might look for to know if we're headed in that direction? What would you be looking for in the economy and what would the results be in terms of jobs and uh, deficit reduction and, and all those? What, what does that really mean for our country? 
Well, uh, I, I think it's absolutely critical. And let me just point out that uh, when President Obama submitted his original budget eight years ago, I believe his assumption was over 4% growth and ha has not been achieved. Um, although the reported unemployment rate is extremely low from any historical basis, a significant component of that is because people who have left the workforce. And if you adjust that for the people who have uh, left the workforce, the number is closer to 8.5 or 9 percent. So we do believe there is significant room for people to come back in the workforce. Um, I can tell you I had the benefit of traveling with the president during the campaign and going to all different parts of this country and meeting with workers in small and medium-sized businesses where many workers haven't had significant increases in their wages in the last 10 years, and that's something that we're focused on. So many people and many economists have cited that over 70 percent of the burden of corporate taxes is actually borne by the workers. So we are focused, I think as you know, we have one of the highest corporate tax rates in the world. We tax on worldwide income. We have this concept of deferral. It's not a surprise that our companies leave trillions of dollars offshore. We're focused on bringing that money back to create jobs and spur investment. And uh, that's really what we'd see in various different economic indicators. And you mentioned a three-pronged approach, which is regulatory reform, uh, tax reform, and uh, trade reform, essentially those three areas as being key ways in which we can grow our economy and create opportunities uh, for Americans. Would you talk a little bit about trade in particular? You know, as I travel my state, um, I see a lot of parts of my community in Kansas, which is a heavy agriculture state, uh, that depend on uh, open trade and free trade with our North American trading partners, particularly uh, Mexico, of course, and, and Canada. But and they're concerned that um, some of the actions we're taking might damage that trade relationship. And there's been debates about um, all sorts of policies that might change the relationship uh, there. And would you talk about uh, how important it is that we uh, get the trade relationship right and maybe reassure some of my agriculture producers in Kansas that they're going to be able to continue to sell as much or more of their grain and meat uh, across the border. Sure. Well, th thank you. And those, those are all very good points. L let me first say that Secretary Ross, myself, Bob Lighthizer, the U.S. Trade Rep, Gary Cohn at the NEC, we're all working very closely together. And uh, I think our counterparties and our allies are much more comfortable with understanding our position on trade. When I showed up at my first G20 at Baden-Baden, I think there was concern about trade wars. Uh, I've now met with many, many of uh, our counterparties. I just got back from Canada last week in meeting with the cabinet there. I mean, let me, let me be very clear. President Trump supports trade. He supports free and fair trade. But free and fair trade is reciprocal trade. And free trade is not, I don't charge you a tariff and you charge me 25%. That's not free trade. That's not reciprocal trade. So we are working very hard. Uh, we want to grow exports. We don't want to shrink imports. Uh, Secretary Ross and I are leading a comprehensive economic dialogue with the Chinese. Um, we had a very good discussion at Mar-a-Lago. We've had several discussions since then. I think you may have seen the announcement that we've opened up our markets to beef. Uh, although beef isn't going to change the trade deficit alone, it's a, a significant start and something that's very important to our, our farmers. Um, so let me just say we are, we are very focused on these issues, and uh, we appreciate your comments on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mrs. Chairman. Lowy. Mrs. Lowy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, a fact sheet from the President's budget discusses improper payments stating, quote, while the majority of government payments are proper, any waste or taxpayer money is unacceptable. I agree with that. The Special Inspector General for TARP, or SIGTARP, recently found that a contractor for a Nevada agency spent $8.2 million in federal dollars on a Mercedes-Benz, parties at casinos, a country club, cocktail bar, gifts for employees, excessive rent in a luxury building, identifying and putting an end to this type of waste is exactly why inspector general divisions are so essential across the government. However, you probably saw this as the New York Times editorial board noted this morning, 
you propose to cut the special IDs budget by 50%? How do you justify cutting the budget for oversight by an IG who is successfully identifying waste and bringing money back to the government? Uh, first of all, uh, even though I've moved to California, I'll always feel like a New Yorker. So uh, thank you for everything you're doing. Um, let me just say it again, as a general comment, uh, we had to make very difficult decisions across the budget and prioritize. So th there are many things that we've cut back that are very, uh, that could be valid. The, the two assumptions that we started with was we wanted to have a balanced budget, and two, the president believed that we needed to make a significant investment in our military, which has been underfunded. So specifically on the SIGTARP, and let me just say I very support uh, the Office of Inspector Generals. I think they have a very important function, not only across Treasury, but across the government. Uh, the reason why we suggested a cut of that OIG by that amount and not the other OIGs, as we looked at, uh, there was a time when the Treasury had tens and tens of billions of dollars uh, that in investments in TARP. Uh, the Treasury's investments in TARP are down to a couple hundred million dollars. So the OIG's responsibility is to look at the existing programs, not what was a vast uh, program. And when, when we looked at the expense of that OIG relative to the other OIG, um, we felt that we were just, again, making difficult decisions of where we were going to cut back items and not making a comment uh, on OIGs, and I think as you see, both the IRS OIG and the uh, regular OIG within Treasury, we had a much, much more modest. So this was specifically uh, addressed a significant shrinking of that OIG's area. Mr. Secretary, I won't continue that debate because as a former New Yorker, I can just imagine the reaction of many of your friends, neighbors, constituents, President Trump's tax plan proposes to eliminate the state and local tax deduction. Eliminating this deduction is estimated to cost the average New Yorker $6,600. Due to the high cost of living, the income of a middle-class family in New York would enable wealth in other parts of the country, while many New Yorkers are still trying to make ends meet. Adding insult to injury, New Yorkers send more taxpayer dollars, we used to call that the Moynihan principle, to the federal government than the state receives in return. That's why for the 3.2 million residents who are able to deduct state and local taxes, the elimination of this deduction is unacceptable in any so-called reform package put before Congress. I just have 55 <laughs> seconds left. So maybe you can tell us how you're going to work to change that, because you know it's not going to be accepted. Now I have 46 seconds. Well, <laughs> if, if you think my friends in New York don't like that, I assure you my friends in California don't like that just as well. Um, again, as, as we propose tax reform, and I think it's been 30 years since we've had tax reform, so we are committed. On the personal side, we are committed to simplifying personal taxes reducing the number of brackets, raising the standard deduction so that 95% of Americans can fill out their taxes on a large postcard as opposed to having lots and lots and lots of paper and hiring professionals. Uh, we are proposing to eliminate all deductions on the personal side other than charitable deductions and mortgage interest. Uh, while I, I appreciate the issue that this could have and I think we're sensitive to the issue on New York, New Jersey, California, and many other of the states. Uh, we want to balance that with we don't believe the federal government should be in the business of subsidizing states. So uh, we are sensitive to that issue. We are sensitive to the economic contribution that New York and California and many of these other states make, and uh, we'll continue to discuss this. Just in the last 31 seconds, as you well know, it's stick a shock for taxpayers who are already paying more in taxes than their community gets in return. So I wish you'd give it some serious thought. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it's totally inappropriate to get rid of that deduction. Thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Ms. Herrera Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I wanted to also echo when I heard you talk about your priorities. Obviously, there are going to be areas where we're going to differ on budget priorities, but overall, um, talking about 3% growth is, is just what we, we in my area in Southwest Washington need. We need, like you said, jo when, as you travel the country um, with the president on the campaign side, you heard from people talking about wages and wage stagnation. That is a picture of some areas in my district, um, and we need to change that and turn that around. So I think reg reform um, and tax relief are huge. And I also am, am excited in, and encouraged to hear your talk about trade and your efforts um, with uh, Secretary Ross, I, I think it needs to be um, a priority. I'm from Washington. We're, you know, one of the most, if not the most, trade dependent state in the in the nation, um, and we want to make sure, just like you said, uh, fair and free trade continues to be um, a, a priority. Um, I did want to mention a couple of things uh, raised to your attention. Um, Credit unions, community banks, small community lenders, the folks that help those medium and small sized businesses grow and thrive and invest in communities. Um, as we traveled across my district in Southwest Washington, I hear from countless small guys, um, entrepreneurs, families about the importance of access to capital. Um, and credit unions and community banks have been, and I believe will be uh, in the future, continue to be a big part of making sure that this, they, that, that these these small mom and pop shops have access to capital. However, the total financial impact of the regulatory burden has increased dramatically on these guys. What are the administration's goals in easing the regulatory burden for credit unions and community banks? So I'm talking about the ones that really serve our communities. Well, thank you. That actually is a perfectly timed question for my advertisement. <laughs> uh, I'm not able to promote anything than government thinks. So this is an advertisement for at six o'clock today. Uh, we will be publicly releasing the first of four reports uh, that we're doing from the President's executive order on what we call the core principles, which, which not only looks at Dodd-Frank, but goes much further than Dodd-Frank. And the overarching theme on that is 50% of the assets of the banking system are held by eight GSIB banks, and there are thousands of community banks regional banks and credit unions that have been overly burdened by regulatory issues. Uh, these banks are not what created the financial crisis. These banks know how to lend in the community. They know how to make loans. They know the people in the community. These banks are what fuel the engine of growth in this economy, which is small and medium-sized businesses. So we, uh, we have a 150-page report. In the back of the report, there will be a long list of very specific items. Uh, a lot of them we will be able to work on with the regulators. I'd say close to 70 or 80 percent uh, we believe are regulatory fixes. There are 20 or 30 percent that will require regulatory issues. Uh, we support Chairman Henserling's Choice Act. But what we were primarily focused on is what are the things that we can do to unlock burdensome regulations and overlapping regulations and work with the regulators. And that's something that in my role as chair of FSOC, uh, I've already begun working with them on. And uh, we appreciate the issue that you've heard. Uh, that's that's a big concern of ours. That's is very encouraging to hear because I think, um, especially going at it in a way that maybe doesn't that doesn't take an act of Congress because sometimes that is a whole lot quicker. And to bring that immediate relief is going to unlock hopefully unlock that capital that's going to get us on that road um, to growth that we are all anxious to see. Um, I, I kind of on that note, I understand the president's executive order calling for a freeze in new regulations did not technically apply to independent regulatory agencies, but the Fed is expected um, to endorse significant new capital requirements. I'm sure you are well aware, referred to as Basel IV. Is this agreement, uh, is this uh, agreement that you were consulted on and support, um, and is it is something that you are planning to consider as part of your financial regulatory review? So uh, let me just first comment that uh, I do follow in the tradition of previous Treasury secretaries that I meet up with the chair of the Fed weekly. Uh, Janet Yellen and I have had very productive conversations every week since I've been in office. And uh, the majority of those conversations are on regulatory issues. Uh, she and I traveled together to the G7 and the G20, meeting with uh, foreign finance ministers and board governors. 
Uh, what you're referring to is Basel IV. I think most of the people kind of are now referring to as Basel III, although I appreciate the confusion in three plus. But uh, the answer is one of the things that, that's also a subject of the report is making sure that our banks don't have competitive disadvantages with the international banks. We've done a much better job at building up capital. And in particular, we don't think that community banks should be subject to these regulations. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Bishop. Thank you very much. And welcome, uh, Mr. Secretary. I'm going to ask uh, three questions, and then you can answer them, Sir Adam, if you like. Uh, the IRS, in April of uh, 2016, released its latest estimate of the tax gap, uh, the difference between what Americans pay in taxes and what they actually owe. Uh, for the years 2008 to 2010, the annual gap averaged a huge $458 billion. <clears throat> the largest source of that tax gap, $125 billion, or 27%, stems from underreporting of business income on individual tax returns, the so-called pass-through income. Uh, the IRS estimates that the main types of pass-through income have been high percentage rates of income misreporting. Partnerships and S-corporations misreport income at a 19% rate, while sole proprietors misreport at a shocking rate of 63%. Uh, the administration's budget does nothing to address this compliance problem. Instead, it's advanced a centerpiece, uh, as a centerpiece of the tax cut plan, a special 15% discount rate for pass-through income that would likely make the problem worse. Uh, the proposal would create a powerful incentive for many wealthy individuals to reclassify as much of their income as possible, and the resulting tax avoidance could cost the government more than $500 billion over the next decade. Are you and the administration serious about closing the tax gap? Uh, won't the tax cut for pass-through income make the problem worse? And my second question, um, the Trump administration is very far behind in filling top-tier positions. Uh, as of last Wednesday, uh, the administration, the president nominated only about one-tenth of the positions that require Senate confirmation. Uh, for Treasury, as of last week, uh, the president has nominated 10 of the 28 critical posts, only one of which, which was you, has been confirmed. Uh, almost six months since inauguration uh, of the president, the Treasury Department has no deputy secretary, no general counsel, no undersecretaries, no assistant secretaries that are confirmed. Assistant Secretaries for Economic Policy, Financial Markets, Financial Stability, Financial Institutions have not been nominated. Uh, is the administration having difficulty recruiting qualified individuals that want to serve? And what impact uh, do these vacancies have on the work of the department? And finally, uh, you mentioned fair and free trade. Uh, I noted with uh, great disappointment the President's indication that he intends to turn back uh, the clock with regard to our relationships with Cuba. How can we uh, uh, seriously want to expand trading, uh, uh, free and fair trade, when we've got a, uh, a neighbor uh, 90 miles away uh, that is receiving and is engaged in very serious uh, uh, commerce uh, with China, Canada, Mexico, uh, but yet we want to turn our backs, and particularly my state of Georgia, we uh, export over 78 billion dollars in agriculture. Uh, and of course, uh, there are other items besides agriculture that we'd love to be able to export just 90 miles away. But uh, it seems the administration wants to go in the opposite direction there. Well, for, first let me thank you for your variety of, of thoughtful questions. So let me make sure I've, I've jotted them down. So the, the first issue on, on the tax gap, I, I can assure you that I am very concerned about the tax gap. And I think the best way to address the tax cap is to simplify our tax system, which is way, way, way too complicated. So an overriding feature of our tax reform, and I refer to it as it's not just a tax cut, it is tax reform, is broadening the base and simplifying it so that the IRS can properly administer the code. Um, specifically as it relates to pass-throughs, um, let me just say, we believe in a business tax, not just a corporate tax. We want to make sure that small and medium-sized businesses that I've mentioned are the engine of driving growth in this country, have the benefit of a fair tax rate. 
Now, having said that, uh, I too share your concern about pass-throughs. And one of the things, we are hard at work at the Treasury, we have over 100 people who are working in the tax department on this, is making sure that we set up rules so that pass-throughs can't be used for the wealthy to dodge taxes and aren't a means of somebody who should be paying 33 or 35 or 30 whatever, uh, paying 15 percent. So we will make sure that wages That's are 16 taxed seconds left. at wages and, uh, and, and not otherwise. Uh, so that's the pass-throughs. On filling positions, um, I can assure you we filled almost every single position. The FBI background checks are what have held up announcements. And then the last part, I would just say uh, we, we are researching, the, we, we are spending some time discussing the Cuba policy. That's under review. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Nice to be with you, Secretary. Thank you. Um, you talk about 3% growth. Uh, would really like to see that. We all would put America back to work. To get there, uh, you talk about, and I quote you here in your statement, opening statement, this much-needed growth will be achieved through a combination of tax reform, regulatory reform, and trade. The trade is a big concern of mine and a big concern of many of my colleagues and a big concern of people in my district. I have a very rural agricultural district. Um, they're waiting on, on pins and needles uh, for markets for exporting sooner rather than later. And I know you're working with um, Secretary of Commerce and our U.S. Trade Representative. Can you tell me what specifically your role is, Treasury's role is, when it comes to trade? Well, um, let me just first say uh, it, it's, it's a collaborative process between the three of us, uh, as, as it relates to specifically, let's just say, China. Uh, in the case of China, uh, Secretary Ross and I are working together on every aspect of the economic dialogue, which includes both investment and trade. It includes financial services, as well as it includes uh, many of the other technology areas and many of the other exports areas. Uh, and I've known Secretary Ross for a long time, and we've worked together for the last year. Can you convince me uh, and others that you are pursuing trade agreements aggressively? Because, um, you know, many of my colleagues, and we've mentioned it here already th this, this afternoon, about the need for trade. Uh, a letter went out from the House of over 50 members of Congress on both sides of the aisle asking the administration to be proactive sooner rather than later on trade. And uh, what are some of the timelines, aside from reopening uh, some of our current trade agreements, NAFTA? Uh, I know the president has preference for bilateral agreements. Can you tell me what, what countries or where we are in pursuing bilateral agreements right now, if that's where the president's preference is? Sure. Well, let me just say uh, the priorities for the moment is first NAFTA, which I, I think, as you know, there's a very complicated fast track this is one of these things, if this is the fast track, I'd hate to know what the slow track was. But uh, I think we've had productive discussions with them. As I said, I just came back from Canada. Uh, I was the first Treasury Secretary to go to Canada in over 10 years. And I did that because of the importance of trade between us and them. Matter of fact, uh, if you look at our overall trade deficit on goods and services, we actually have a slight surplus. Uh, we are very important to the Canadian economy, and we are specifically going to look for opportunities for us to increase trade with Canada. Uh, Mexico as well. Um, NAFTA is a very old agreement. Uh, there's issues that we have as it relates to specifically the auto industry and others. Um, but we're very focused on NAFTA. We're very focused on China. Um, again, I think uh, we agreed to have a 100-day plan with China. We've agreed, and China understands it's in our interest and their interest to shrink the trade gap, and that is by us growing exports. What about some of those countries that were in the Trans-Pacific Partnership that are in the Asia-Pacific Rim um, who, were, who were waiting uh, on America to <laughs> come together with that TPP agreement? I mean, uh, those are markets. Uh, they need our goods. We want to export to them. They need our values as well, and especially in the shadow of China and showing great strength over there. Uh, I think can show China, uh, they show great respect for those who are strong. 
And so I, I just think that we're missing some opportunities here. I know China is very important. I know NAFTA is as well. But there's so many other countries out there that are, are waiting uh, to grow as well, and we can use them as well to grow our economy. And to get to the 3% that we need, we can do tax uh, reform and simplification here in Congress. Uh, help you with regulatory reform, but when it comes to trade, to get to the three percent, we really need the administration to be aggressive. And I thank you, and I yield my time. Thank you. I understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Uh, next, Mr. Cartwright, and then Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Secretary, for being here today. Um, I want to talk about taxes a little bit and uh, the so-called Mnuchin rule which I gather you didn't name. Would that be correct? That is correct. <laughs> Nevertheless, you were talking about uh, these principles, uh, about n having no absolute tax cut for the wealthiest. These were things you were saying back in November. You said, uh, more specifically, any, any uh, benefit that high earners would see from cutting tax rates would be offset by eliminating deductions currently available. Um, uh, you were saying things to that effect, am I correct? That is correct. All right. Uh, the question is, uh, if, um, if Congress passes a tax uh, plan uh, that does not adhere to that so-called Mnuchin rule, will President Trump veto it? Uh, no, he will, he will not veto it, okay? The President believes that tax reform is critical to the American worker, to the middle class, and the president is working closely with the House and the Senate to get tax reform done. And this is a collaborative process and something that I hope we get Democratic support from as well. We need tax reform. And uh, the president uh, will hopefully be in a position to sign a bill and turn it into law this year to have much needed tax reform in this country to spur this economy. Secretary, is it, are you saying that uh, the only way that this can be punched through Congress is to give uh, the absolute wealthiest, the highest earners, uh, an absolute tax cut? That's the only way politically we can get uh, tax reform through? Is that what you're saying? No, that, that's not what I'm saying at all. And, and again, uh, I, I didn't name the rule. I said our objective, which is true. And if you uh, ask uh, the members uh, who represent New York and California and others, Okay, and when we ultimately come out with the plan, we'll show what the distribution is. Uh, that, 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 that was our intent. We're taking away almost every single deduction, so a huge component of the reduction will be offset with less deductions for the rich. So you mean you're going to try to adhere to the so-called Benuchin rule, but if, if you're not able to, uh, that's not a, d a deal breaker for the White House. Uh, a, 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 again, the administration, first of all, I want to be clear. I did not name it as a rule, okay? Just I a said promise, it was an right? objective. No, I never made it as a promise. I said it was an objective, okay? And again, I think as you see, our current proposal, which lowers tax rates, is offset with a staggering reduction of deductions. And when we come out with the distribution, um, I, I think we're actually... Uh, You'll see what it looks like. All right, I want to talk about the so-called Financial Choice Act that you have expressed general support for. Am I correct in that? That is correct. Um, and I appreciate your comments, by the way, about uh, relieving the burden on local and community banks. Uh, I think that's a widely shared objective. Thank you. Um, but I want to talk about some of the provisions in the Choice Act that passed the House last week. Um, I'm curious, it, do you support removing <laughs> transparency from executive pay? Uh, if the Choice Act becomes law, companies will no longer be required to disclose the disparity of pay between their CEOs and the employee average uh, of those institutions. Uh, they won't even be required to disclose if executives are allowed to bet against their own company's stock prices. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, are those disclosures real, really that costly? Uh, do, you, do, do you support eliminating those disclosure requirements? Um, let me just first say I have great respect for the legislative process, okay? And overall, I do support the Choice Act and what it's trying to do, and now I look forward to working with the Senate as to what will go forward. As it relates to executive pay, I have always viewed that boards should be held accountable for executive pay. In this country, too many boards 
delegate that responsible to paid consultants, which make no sense. Boards should be held accountable. And one of the things you'll see in our report and others, and when I speak to the regulators, boards shouldn't be overburdened by clerical things. Boards should be focused on risk and controlling management. I'm sorry, it's a kind of a yes or no question, Secretary. Do you support those parts of the Financial Choice Act that eliminate transparency in the instances that I cited? Uh, it, 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 again, I'm, 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 I'm focused on the overall bill and not the line item of every single thing. I, for one, think, okay, as it relates to transparency, uh, through proxies, shareholders and workers see what executives get paid. Whether they're on a relative basis or not, I, I don't have a strong opinion on that portion of it one way or another. I do absolutely believe in proper disclosure of executive pay through the proxy system, and I do support uh, shareholders voting for boards who should be held accountable on executive pay. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, sir, and Mr. Secretary, thank you and welcome. It's good to be with you. I have to say, and it's been said many times actually, and, and generally in a bipartisan way as well, that the President has assembled an extraordinary cabinet, and, and I think you are one of those, and we appreciate you for willingness to serve. I'm going to hit on a couple things very quickly and then try to allow you time to respond. i got to echo Mr. Young's comments if I could. I was in China a couple months ago. While we were there, we met with the, you know, the senior leadership. They announced that they would allow the importation of U.S. beef, which is a big deal for you know, many districts, including mine. Uh, we were glad for that. Uh, many of us, though, were, had mixed feelings about TPP. I hope you can recreate TPP. We can call it Trump Pacific Partnership if you want. Uh, but, but it's just important that we continue to pursue these, these agreements. And I appreciate that you feel the same way. And I, I believe the President does as well. Does as well. And uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to do. We understand that. But it's worth it, I believe. As is tax reform, as you've said here, it's difficult. Uh, again, I support the administration goals and things you've said. The key to economic growth and really the key to bettering American the lives of American people is economic growth. And regulatory reform, tax reform, trade, all of those are key to that. But there's one other element to it, and this is my question now. And I'm afraid you, you may not like my question, but I really would appreciate your views on it. Over the last several months as they've released the budget, the skinny budget, and then the full budget. I think everyone sitting up here on the dais has had dozens or hundreds of meetings with people who came and are concerned about the budget. Just generally, by the nature of their concerns, these are often uh, Democrats. They're liberal-leaning groups because they are interested in government funding for their organizations, whether it's for the arts, whether it's for, I mean, pick an agency. And they're, they're advocating for that. And I often say to those folks, you got to go across the aisle and talk to our Democratic friends and convince them that they've got to work with us on mandatory spending, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Because until we're willing to take on that challenge, all of these pressures, these budget pressures, are going to fall on these different agencies, whether it's NIH, again, education, arts, all of them. And I wonder if you'd share with us your thoughts, the administration's view on being willing to tackle that. It's an enormous problem, I know that. Uh, it's politically difficult, but if we don't take that on, we're not going to fix, uh, you know, the, the debt challenge we have, and the pressures will continue <coughs> to fall on these other agencies. Give us your sense on that, will you please, that we can maybe see some work on that over the next few years. Well, for, first let me just comment on, on TPP, and, and, and there are many aspects uh, of the agreement that do make sense. It's just the agreement overall doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, we fundamentally think we can get better deals negotiating bilateral deals. That doesn't mean that it, in times there, it doesn't make sense to do a, a larger deal. And, and just to be clear, yeah. I agree with you. I, I don't think Thank it you. was a great agreement. I think we, could, we can do better. And you know, l l let me assure you again, our objective is more trade. Okay, you know, as I like to say, I went to my first G20 and it was 19 to 1 against me on the communique uh, over this trade issue. And as I like to explain to people, we are the most open market, the largest trading market, other than a CFIUS review for national security. Anybody can invest here. So anybody who wants to have reciprocal trade on the same terms as us, we're all for that. Bring it on. Um, as it relates to your, your, your mandatory spending, uh, the President has made it clear that uh, on Social Security, that's not something that he's addressing now. Uh, 
But uh, if, if Congress wants to review that, obviously that's, that's within your prerogative. Okay. Um, of course, we need a partner in the White House who will work with us on those, and we understand it may not be the priority right now, and I actually support that, that, it may, that, that prioritizing is, is not one I would disagree with. But strategically, long term, we got to be willing to take that on, and we would hope and encourage the administration, and yourself included, to work with us, if not in the next year or two years, maybe in the second half of this first term to take on that challenge. So uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary. You. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Hey, Ms. Stewart. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's apparent that we have some NBA Finals fans here because there's been some good clock management going on. And uh, we're going to get to go just a little bit uh, longer if everybody uh, uh, wants to uh, participate with additional questions. Mr. Secretary, I, I have just a couple. Um, now that you've had a few meetings of FSOC under your belt and as the chairman of the, of the group there, if you could just sort of give us an update on the direction of the council and uh, where it's going. In addition, uh, you've been directed by the president uh, back in April to review the processes, and maybe you could update us on that review and, uh, and then speak to, uh, I guess it was processes, um, multiple processes, but if you could speak to uh, your review of, of CIFIs and uh, your thoughts on, on that designation as well. Okay, so um, l let me just say uh, I have had several meetings of FSOC. In, in my mind, FSOC has two fundamentally very important functions. One is around the designation. And uh, given the significance of, of that issue, the President signed a specific executive order, so it's not covered in our existing finding, and we look forward to doing the work on that and making a recommendation. Um, the other function of FSOC is bringing the regulators together, and actually one of our recommendations uh, to Congress in the report that we're putting out tonight is to give more power to FSOC, and specifically the Treasury Secretary, to work with and coordinate the regulators. So uh, FSOC should not be the, a, a replacement for the regulators. But what, as an example, one of the things that we will recommend is where there are overlapping issues, okay? Uh, cybersecurity is one which is perfectly clear to me. Cyber is one of my most important priorities. Uh, to the extent a bank is reviewed by the Fed, the OCC, the FDIC, and the Consumer Protection Bureau, we think that one agency should be named as the lead agency and coordinate amongst all the rest of them. So uh, I do think that FSOC is a very important area to get the regulators to make sure they're working together to deal with overlap. And then finally on CFIUS, again, this is something I take very seriously. Uh, CFIUS, we, we have a lot of resources dedicated to CFIUS, both within Treasury and across the government. Uh, the National Security Review, is very, very important. And I can tell you uh, that uh, there's been many transactions already this year that we have indicated to the parties that uh, we would not approve of them and would send them to the president, and there have been voluntary withdrawals. So the fact that you haven't seen a lot of information coming out of CFIUS doesn't mean that there's not a lot of work being done. There is. It's a confidential process, and we respect that. Do you, do you believe that process is flawed? Have you discovered that in your review, the uh, CIFI process, uh, particularly for non-banks? Um, that, that, that's something that would be premature to, to comment on. We haven't, uh, we're doing a lot of work on it, and I think as you were aware, there's some litigation around one situation in particular, so I don't want to make any specific comments on that. Oh, that's fair, thank you. Uh, and then also, in, in the spirit of reducing spending and eliminating uh, government waste, the President signed an, another executive order to reorganize and streamline the executive branch agencies and uh, requiring them to identify duplicative um, or inefficient uh, uh, processes. Can you, you know, from your, your perch there in Treasury, how's that review going? Anything you can report back to us? Is that reflected in the budget proposal that we've, we've already seen? Um, there's been a series of recommendations that we've made to the White House on this. Uh, I don't believe the savings are fully incorporated into the budget. I know they're not in the case of our budget, so this is an area where we look forward to additional savings. Um, we think there's things that can be consolidated where you have multiple departments doing things that can be brought together more efficiently, um, given that uh, some of these 
uh, impact uh, a lot of different people across the government. I don't want to go into the specifics today, but, we, but to we, we look forward to working with Congress on these recommendations. What, what criteria might you government. use uh, as you go through this process? Is there a, a set criteria? Being well, my, my, my criteria, and I look at this as no different criteria than when I was in business. What can we do to deliver better service at less expense and be more efficient? And that's, uh, that's something we're focused on. So it's not just cost savings, it's efficiency. Where can we save money but deliver more efficient services? And whether that's on national security or whether that's on managing a lot of the programs, we're looking at across the board. And then lastly on this, I understand that you can't go into some of the details at this point, but I, I suspect that you've, you've discovered some overlap or some inefficiencies and in, in ways to do things for less. What would be the timeline that we can expect as a committee that we might see this review or report that would help us as we move forward? Um, I, I, I hope it's something that we can get to you this year because the sooner we get it to you, the sooner these changes can be incorporated and uh, the better off we can all be. Great, thank you. Mr. Quigley and then Mr. Yoder. Thank you. Uh, just clarification, I believe when talking with um, ranking member Ms. Lowy, you indicated that there's only a couple hundred million dollars remaining in TARP investments, um, but uh, I've been led to believe that Treasury is still obligated or committed to pay about $14 billion in the HAMP program. Um, is that accurate to your understanding? So there, there's, there's, a di there's a difference in what I was saying, that the, the, the couple of hundred million that I was referring to are the investments that are on effectively the Treasury's balance sheet. The HAMP program has been fully committed. The HAMP program is, uh, is no longer an impact. Um, the OIG and others have been uh, reviewing these HAMP loan modifications now for, I believe, about seven or eight years. We're actually proud of the fact that loan modifications started in IndyMac under the FDIC, and then we converted to HAMP, so this is something I, I do know a reasonable amount about. Thank you. You also mentioned in changing topics here in your written testimony that uh, uh, the Treasury's request prioritizes national security and prioritizes the Department's wide range of financial tools toward that end. Uh, we're talking about sanctions, and in many respects, uh, you're sort of the watchdog on such things, uh, making sure that they're actually enforced. And, uh, and I'm sure you believe that uh, sanctions are an extraordinarily important diplomatic tool, say, going to war, to make sure uh, other countries comply with the rule of law and what other countries believe is appropriate. Uh, North Korea, uh, the Iran deal, uh, the sanctions on Russia involving Ukraine. Uh, but again, there is a cut uh, to the Office of Terrorism and Financial Intelligence by six million and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN, by two million, uh, particularly at a time when um, all of these countries are ramping up their efforts to circumvent sanctions by money laundering. Um, well, first of all, let me just comment, and I appreciated the opportunity for us to meet earlier. Um, I firmly believe in these sanctions programs. I'm probably spending 50% of my time on what we call terrorist financing and intelligence. These work. So there is no question that the only reason Iran came to the table was because of the sanctions that we put on in conjunction with our allies. Uh, so I, I can assure you uh, this is something that at the National Security Council we talk about constantly. I work closely with Secretary Mattis, with Secretary Tillerson, with General McMaster. Uh, we believe in sanctions. We've already put a significant number of new sanctions, uh, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Iran's ballistic missile programs, terrorist financing, whether it's Syria. This administration will continue to use sanctions to the maximum amount allowable by law. Now, let me just make just two common administrative things. Uh, the, the $117 million that we requested was in, intended to be flat to what was the continuing resolution. Now, when the omnibus was approved, we got a little bit more money. So uh, it was somewhat unintentional that there was a, a small cut on that. Um, like other 
national security parts of the government. It was intended to remain flat. And I'd also like to just say uh, we are very pleased by the MOU that was just signed with the Gulf countries, um, setting up a terrorist financing center that we will co-chair in Saudi Arabia. That's something that was done after the budget was submitted. So uh, I will be working with Director Mulvaney uh, on, on how we fund that, because that is something that uh, we've done since the budget was funded. So you were anticipating something else in the omnibus? Excuse me? You were anticipating a different we, 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 we were We were pleased that we got a little bit more money for, for TFI. And, and again, let me just emphasize. I mean, would you have funded, I mean, we're just short on time, would you have funded at the omnibus levels if they had been made aware of those increases earlier? Uh, again. Now's the time to speak. Uh, l l let me just say uh, I am supportive of the difficult decisions, but if you all want to put more money in TFI, uh, I firmly believe in TFI, and as I mentioned, I'm going to need to come back to you uh, for more money on the terrorist financing center. Clearly, these the, the people who are money laundering are doing it for counterterrorism ter efforts and to evade taxes at home and to avoid sanctions. So it has to be a priority for multiple reasons. It, it, it is a huge priority of ours. Uh, we look forward to working with you. And as I said, this is a very important national security tool uh, that's very effective in an important way not to put our military at risk. Thank you. Mr. Yoder and Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to discuss an issue uh, with you that my colleague, Congresswoman Eddie Bernice Johnson, and I raised with you on a letter uh, sent to you on March 29th. Uh, as you know, the Chinese financial transaction company, Ant Financial, has proposed to purchase MoneyGram, an American company that is the second largest provider of money transfers in the world. This acquisition is currently under review by the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, CFIUS. Uh, MoneyGram is a large financial institution with a volume of transactions similar in size to many large U.S. banks. You're likely aware that Ant Financial is partially owned by the Chinese government. The idea that a company owned at least in part by a foreign government is purchasing an American financial institution raises some concerns. In addition, MoneyGram is required by U.S. law to collect and store sensitive personal information on all of its customers. China has proven its ability and desire to hack sensitive American information through the OPM hack two years ago, and the idea of the Chinese government having direct access to the personal data of millions of Americans is very concerning. I appreciate that you value cybersecurity. In your written testimony, you highlight your budget's request to investment in cybersecurity, and you stated that, quote, protecting Treasury and the financial system from cyber attacks is critical to our financial stability, end quote. I believe that the MoneyGram acquisition has a significant cybersecurity implication, and I'm hoping today that you give us some of your thoughts on the situation. I recognize that you are not able to comment directly on an ongoing case, but in general, what concerns do you have about the potential for a foreign government to have a stake in a company that handles directly handles the private financial data of Americans? How might CFIUS mitigate those concerns? Is there precedent for the situation where a foreign acquisition could lead to a foreign government having access to American financial data? And also, mem members of Americans' armed forces use MoneyGram at a disproportionately high rate due to their frequent need to transfer money back home. I'm concerned that their financial information uh, may be especially valuable to the Chinese government, and the exposure of their information may be especially harmful to our security regarding troop movements and their location, and wire transfers, et cetera. Would CFIUS supply any special scrutiny into this type of situation? Well, for, first of all, thank you for the question. And uh, I am familiar with your letter, and I am very familiar with the transaction. Uh, I do take my role as chair of CFIUS very seriously. Um, it is an interagency responsibility. Uh, as I previously mentioned, I think it is very important that we review transactions for national security. Uh, some people have uh, suggested we expand various, various aspects. I look forward to working with Congress on uh, whether it's joint venture or other aspects of CFIUS and how perhaps it may make sense to, to change the legislation. Um, Given the confidential nature, I want to be very specific that uh, I am not prepared to make any specific comments about this transaction. But I can assure you that the President and I take our national security as the highest priority. That is one of the reasons why he wants to increase the military budget substantially. That's one of the reasons why we've announced significant sanctions and will continue 
to announce sanctions, and to the extent that a transaction comes before CFIUS that we believe is a threat to national security, uh, we will attempt to mitigate it. If we can't, we will, if it's not withdrawn, send it to the president. And as I have suggested, uh, just because you don't see things going to the president doesn't mean there's not a lot of activity. There is a lot of activity. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bishop and then Ms. Ferrer Butler. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you indicated that one of the top priorities or the top two priorities was the taxpayer. Uh, I want to ask you about the IRS's use of private companies uh, to collect taxes on a commission basis, as I'm concerned that this program could result in innocent taxpayers being targeted and defrauded by criminals. Uh, both IRS and the Treasury Inspector General have noted that there's been a huge surge in the number of aggressive and threatening phone calls from criminals impersonating IRS agents targeting innocent taxpayers with police arrest, deportation, license revocation, among other things. But under the private tax collection program, private collection firms are now calling taxpayers directly and identifying themselves as contractors of the IRS. Uh, given that IRS has historically preferred to contact taxpayers by letter and not by phone, often saying that if you're surprised to be hearing from us, then you're not hearing from us, uh, won't allowing private collection firms to call taxpayers and identify themselves as representatives of the IRS simply confuse taxpayers and invite further aggressive tax schemes. Uh, as a condition of receiving contract collect, uh, contracts <clears throat> to collect unpaid taxes on a commission basis, the IRS has stipulated that all private collection companies which respect taxpayer rights, including uh, among other things, abiding by the consumer protection provisions of the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Uh, despite these assurances, one of the four companies currently under contract to collect taxes on a commission basis had its contract with the U.S. Department of Education terminated in 2015 for providing inaccurate information to student loan recipients. Given the fact that one of the companies involved in the private debt collection program already has a history of deceptive business practices, how can taxpayers be assured that these companies won't simply seek to exploit that situation uh, for the company's financial gain? So uh, let, me, let me first say, uh, obviously, this is a decision that predated me. And in general, uh, I am supportive of using outside firms on, on a contingency basis after all other means have been used. I, I was not familiar with the, the issue of one of the four had violations with the Department of Education. I will instruct my staff to look into it. That is concerning to me. And uh, we will also make sure later in the year we have the IRS report back to us an evaluation of this. I think it's a balance between making sure the government collects money uh, efficiently and appropriately uh, with making sure we don't jeopardize taxpayers. So I, I share your concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rear Butler. Thank you. Thank, am I on? There we go. You're on. Thank you. Um, I, I'm going to follow up on something that has already been talked about, but I wanted to just um, underline it a little bit um, as you're moving forward just to um, uh, to have a perspective it is it, about about a program that I believe is not just bi bipartisan but 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 crucial to areas where we have where it is beyond r rural it's borderline frontier in some of our regions um, uh, community development financial institutions fund uh, funding for the CDFI fund has been eliminated as we've talked about and in one CDFI in my district um, has invested over 30 million in small businesses and rural economic development, which would not have been possible without the support of, of this fund. Um, that funding helped create over 600 jobs, which may seem very small, but in a county that makes up about 20,000 people, 600 jobs um, is a lifeline. Um, and I will point out as well, 
again, I come back to the imagery you used earlier when you talked about traveling with the president into certain areas, the people that you were reaching with the message you were reaching, um, this is that type of county. This, these are those people. <laughs> um, CDFIs don't duplicate what banks do. They complement traditional financial institutions by helping startups or troubled businesses that would otherwise um, have, have trouble accessing traditional financing. Um, and I think eliminating this fund would um, would eliminate a, uh, a safeguard that kind of fills a, a gap, essentially. So I guess as we move forward, um, uh, I, I guess I would just ask that the administration consider this as, as you know, we've got many more budgets to come. Um, and as you're prioritizing, reprioritizing, I recognize the challenge of eliminating um, and reducing spending. I just want to put in a plug for this one. Sure. So, I mean, l l let me just comment. And first of all, you know, I'm, I'm very familiar with the CDFIs, and I, I do agree with you. They provide a, a very significant benefit to many communities. Um, this was just, and I, and I realize there has been bipartisan support for them as well, so I appreciate you raising it. Um, let me just comment. Th this was just a difficult decision and us trying to save money and different things. Uh, the two comments that I would make is one, uh, this program was started a long time ago when there, were, there wasn't private contributions. Um, we still do have a program of bond guarantees to CDFIs which help people. We still have a, a significant amount of money left on new market tax credits which also helps significantly. And another thing uh, for me to advertise the report that's coming out tonight I, didn't, I did not arrange this with, yeah, exactly. with the Secretary. Yeah, we, we haven't had any discussion on this. Is I, I'm calling for a task force to review the Community Reinvestment Act. And uh, I think that banks spend billions and billions and billions of dollars fulfilling their CRA obligations, which I support. Uh, I think in too many cases, this money is not properly going to the community. And I want to make sure we meet with community advocates, with nonprofit groups, uh, with community leaders, CDFIs, and others to, to make sure that the billions and billions of dollars that banks are spending, which is far larger than what we support on CDFI, is absolutely going to help communities and isn't just a check the box to satisfy uh, regulators or shareholders. Thank you. I appreciate that, and I yield back. Thank you. And I think what we hear from the Secretary uh, multiple times today is that he respects the process and uh, and recognizes the concerns and interests of the committee. And if we can balance those interests with uh, with others, uh, he, he has the greatest respect for that. Mr. Cartwright and then Mr. Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, I want to uh, return to the, the HAMP program. Of course, HAMP stands for Home Affordable Modification Program, right? It does. And that was part of the, the TARP, the Trouble Asset Relief Program, right? Yes. Um, and the idea was to help homeowners uh, who were uh, uh, upside down with their mortgages and figure out a way to help them keep their homes, right? That's correct. All right. So uh, in addition to creating that, it, it created the SIG TARP, which is the, the watchdog over not only TARP, but specifically uh, the HAMP program, right? That is correct. Okay. And now that's been a successful uh, venture. Uh, the uh, the watchdog, the uh, SIG TARP, Special Inspector General, has been very successful as an office. They have uh, uh, charged 96 bankers with crimes and has actually uh, convicted 36 of them. Would I be correct in that? That sounds right. Um, holding the bankers accountable for the bailout money, basically, that they got through the, the HAMP program to help people stay in their homes. Um, the, um, uh, the, the current SIG TARP uh, Special ins uh, Inspector General is the Honorable Christy Goldsmith Romero. Am I correct in that? Yes. Um, and uh, she took the... Um, uh, unusual uh, action of uh, making public comment about this budget. This is a budget that cuts SIG TARP's uh, uh, money in half, correct? Yeah, I don't think there's anything unusual. They have the right to do that, and I would have been, quite frankly, surprised had we cut the budget and the head of SIG TARP didn't say something otherwise. The question is, SIG TARP's budget is cut in half under this that, budget? That, that is correct, but All again, right. let, let me just highlight 
okay? Well, that I, all I, want, I only OIG have three minutes left, Secretary, Sorry, and I want, to, I want to repeat what her comment was. Her comment was basically that uh, uh, even though this is an office that has come up with 40 times return on investment, SIGTARP, uh, holding uh, bankers' feet to the fire that they comply with the terms of TARP and the HAMP program, uh, even though it's been an enormously successful office, this, the office of the watchdog SIGTARP, uh, this is a budget uh, that cuts their money in half, and according to uh, SIGTARP uh, Romero, uh, she said uh, this, this budget proposal substantially inhibits SIGTARP from performing the duties of the office, including audits and criminal investigations, uh, and uh, and and uh, it said uh, this places critical federal government's interests at risk and substantially inhibits the OIG in carrying out its duties and responsibility. That's what Christy Goldsmith Romero said. And uh, with respect to that, I have a couple questions. Number one, have you met with her after she she made that public statement? I, I have not. But I'd be happy to if she wanted to meet with me. Wouldn't it make sense for you to, I mean, that's a fairly damning statement about the, your budget decision on her agency, isn't it? I, I, again, let me just comment and let me say I respect the committee's views on different things. SIGTARP was spending more money, the entire OIG, for Treasury. And again, the HAMP program, which I'm widely familiar with, uh, the modifications, I think, were quite successful. I believe the banks would have done the loan modifications anyway without the billions of dollars of taxpayer money that was spent. These HAMP have been, they've been reviewed every year. We're not suggesting, okay, this is merely an efficiency. And I have reviewed with, I have reviewed this with the OIG of the Treasury uh, to get their opinion. But again, if you respectfully disagree, you can all decide to, change the funding. I'm interested in, in your view. I mean, aren't you concerned that the, the watchdog is saying, I can't do my job, my job that has put 36 bankers in jail who are abusing the program. Doesn't that bother you that, that she's saying she can't do her job under your budget? I, again, I, I have the utmost of respect for the OIGs and what's been done. Uh, people who have reviewed this came back and made the recommendation that there were efficiencies. And I've never met a regulator or an OIG when you cut their budget in half doesn't object to it. So again, I had other people, not myself, independently review and make this recommendation. Well, Mr. Secretary, will you make this commitment? Will you meet with her and go over it? I, I'd be more than happy to. Well, you know, kind of, uh, I will address my staff. And let me just assure you that any time, any OIG, I've met with the OIG from the IRS. I've met with the OIG from Treasury. Any time any OIG calls my office, I pick up the phone. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Young. Final question. I'm looking forward to your 150-page report today at 6 p.m. Thank you. I'm going to print it out, take it home, and read it. Uh, and I'm glad you're doing something about uh, a lot of the rules and regulations that have been put down on our smaller community banks, credit unions. Um, relief is needed out there. And when we talk about rural America, uh, you know, the strength of the, the borrowing and lending in that area is, is with our community banks. So, and I hear a lot of, from community banks about reporting requirements as well that were not included in the original Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, um, but some requirements that have come out because of rulemakings and rules and regulations. I hope that your report, your report may address uh, some of those issues as well that maybe not necessarily were included within the Dodd-Frank. You mentioned the, the Community uh, Reinvestment Act. Maybe there's some other uh, piece of legislation as well that have been out there, laws that that you're addressing. It, it does. It specifically raises the limit on qualified residential mortgages for community banks. And uh, I think as you appreciate, particularly community banks in areas that are rural with farming and agricultural, which is a seasonal business, uh, they know how to make these loans. They understand how to underwrite these individuals, and they don't need regulators to tell them they can't make these loans. Well, I appreciate your comment there about these people know their community the best. There's a real accountability there. Uh, they know each other, respect each other, and they want to build a better community with one another. Uh, 
you say in your statement here, this budget prioritizes funding for Treasury's wide array of economic and financial tools, including sanctions. Um, as part of the recently passed fiscal year 2017 omnibus appropriations bill, the Treasury Department is directed to review all sanction designation removals related to Iran during the past two years and determine whether these entities have engaged in any prohibited activities since the removal of sanctions. Treasury is then requested to either sanction entities engaged in prohibited activity or explain why not. Uh, I'm not asking you to tell me what you're going to determine, uh, but I just hope that you are on track and you're taking this seriously and that you have you are committed to making sure that this review is done uh, in an appropriate manner and uh, relate to us so that we can be helpful if we need to be. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Mnuchin, thank you for your, your time today. As you can see, this is a very thoughtful committee, adept at the issues, and, uh, and, and enjoy the topics, and I appreciate uh, your thoroughness today. Uh, my, my takeaway uh, for our committee and, and, and for everyone uh, else is that uh, you have an unwavering commitment that I have a great appreciation for to the taxpayer. And, uh, and that's uh, from what I heard today, by balancing the budget, uh, a, a, a fair and flat and family-friendly tax code, uh, building a vibrant economy, but all of that wrapped up and defended by a strong military that respects the men and women who, who have and do and will don our uniforms. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you, thank you for your commitment. Thank you. And uh, with that, there are no other questions. Uh, we stand adjourned.